Hello, everyone. Uh, great to see you. I'm JB Holston. I'm the CEO of the Greater Washington Partnership. Uh, thanks for joining us for Fresh Take, where we talk to uh, great leaders uh, in the region or nationally who are doing great things. Uh, and I'm delighted today to have as our guest, Carol Thompson Cole. Good morning or good afternoon or good midday, Carol, I should say. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. A little bit of background about uh, Carol and uh, Venture Philanthropy Partners, Ray's DC, for those of you who don't know. Um, Carol Thompson Cole has extensive executive management experience. Um, if I read her entire resume, that would take up our entire fresh take. So I, I won't do that. Uh, but uh, Carol's worked both in the public and private sectors, a strong history of leadership, particularly in the greater Washington region's philanthropy and nonprofit community, as well as federal and local government. She successfully partnered with cross-sector stakeholders, building networks in the region to tackle major social challenges, bringing expertise, passion, and reach necessary to achieve life-changing results. I know exactly how difficult all of that is, uh, Carol. So thank you for all of that commitment. Uh, born and raised in the region with deep roots in the community, uh, Carol Thompson Cole began work at Venture Philanthropy Partners in 2003. So it's your 18th anniversary this year, uh, yes. uh, which is great. And became president and CEO in 2007. Uh, prior to this experience, highlights included special advisor to President Clinton on the district and executive director of the DC Interagency Task Force, executive office of the president, vice president for government and environmental affairs at RJR Nabisco, uh, the District of Columbia City Administrator, deputy mayor for operations and deputy mayor for economic development at uh, in the District of Columbia. So welcome again, uh, Carol, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I thought we'd start by talking a little bit about um, backgrounds and really two, two elements here, Carol, if we can. One is I'd love to talk about the origin story for, uh, for Venture Philanthropy Partners, um, but maybe we could start uh, by your journey. Um, you've obviously been in a whole in a, in a wide range of contexts uh, and um, understanding how that took you to venture philanthropy partners as it was getting going I, I think would uh, would be interesting for our audience okay so I'm born and raised in Washington DC I attended uh, public schools um, graduate of the DC public schools having been in K through 12. And uh, as I was ready to go off to college, uh, it was a time of unrest in our city and in our country. And I'm the oldest of six and my family decided to move into Montgomery County, Maryland. And my father's view was that he got me off to a good school and he wanted to make sure that the opportunity was there for my five siblings. And so that's when I started to really begin to understand the differences in communities and opportunity uh, as we were making that journey out of the city into the suburbs, and I was making my journey to Smith College. And so uh, I think one of the first things that really hit me, having been a really high achieving scholar in DC, um, my first year at Smith was not the easiest. I had to spend a lot of time in remedial work uh, in terms of writing and uh, really learning how to critically think. And so it's made me start to realize if I did so well there, why am I having to go through this? And so um, as I was in college, I uh, was very lucky to be in a place that had all the resources and opportunities and really pushed me to move to do the best that I could be. I went off to college thinking that I would be going into the foreign service and pushing democratic principles across the country, but kind of shifted uh, to American government and decided I wanna come back home to my region and really help to improve opportunities for all. So that's where it all got started. So I went to NYU and got a degree uh, in public administration and actually had the opportunity to co come home. And you've talked about the different places I've been. So I started in city government. Well, I started actually on Capitol Hill uh, and, and the house district committee when home rule was put into place. And uh, I realized that either you stay on Capitol Hill and be a lifetime staffer or you become a member, but I wanted to really get some experience. And I went to the Urban Institute and I really learned there about you know, evidence-based programs and how important research was to really helping you to do the best in the public administration world. So I went to HUD and then I ended up 12 years in the government of the District of Columbia. 
as I was leaving city government, that's when we had some of the most intractable problems that were beginning to hit our community. Homelessness, uh, issues of the crack epidemic, uh, you know, declining schools. And so I knew then that to solve the problems facing our communities that we really had to do more public private partnerships. And actually I was part of one when I was the deputy mayor for economic development, uh, which was the uh, DC downtown partnership, which is the forerunner to the bid that is very successful here in our community and several bids in our community today. And I realized that we had the same intentions for our community but we really had different language and different points of views. And we had to figure out how we could really work together to align our resources and accesses to get the results that we really wanted. And so having had that experience, I had the opportunity to go to the White House and was part of the team that did the revitalization plan that has led to the wonderful city that we have today. But I also realized why the opportunity was greater and the economy was much better in the city, there was still many people in our community, many young people and families that had great needs. And uh, I went out and did some consulting work and 9-11 hit and I was traveling a lot. And I said to my husband, I said, I'm gonna come back home and really wanna double down. And that's how I found BPP. I reached out to several of my friends said, I wanna come home, I'm done with going to government. What's happening in the city? And I learned about Venture Philanthropy Partners. I met Mario Marino. And as you said, this is my 18th anniversary here. Why VPP? VPP provides a wonderful opportunity to bring together all parts of our community to really solve the most intractable problems that we're faced with. And uh, I know a lot of times people feel like whenever a new organization comes into play that they're trying to take over and do different. And I always say to people, there's so much that needs to be done. We have a place, all of us have a place. It's just how do we align? How do we connect in the right ways and learn from each other and make the advances that are so necessary for all in our community? Thank you for that. Sorry, I was groping toward my unmute button, which you'd think would not be a problem a year into this, but thank you for that, uh, Carol. Um, talk to us, if you would, a little bit about how the, the partnership was originally formed. You mentioned one of the philanthropists who was instrumental in, in getting it going, but I know it's had a very broad range of support uh, across the philanthropic um, community. So let's talk a little bit about the origins in the early years of VPP, if we could. So VPP was started in 2000. And it was after several years of really doing landscape across the region and across the country about what worked in philanthropy and the founders and founding investors in VPP, they were technologists and venture capitalists. And they said, what made us successful and how can we replicate that or can we replicate it to do good? And so uh, venture philanthropy was being uh, tested around the country in about 12 organizations. And we were one of them. We were the only one at the time that was truly place-based. And so the originators decided that they really wanted to give back to the community. Most of them lived in our community. They made their wealth here, but they were giving across the world. And so VPP became that opportunity to become connected to the greater Washington area and really bring their learnings and their resources to help. And so we kind of became, uh, when I came on board in 2003, we started to bring people like myself who had been uh, living here, working here, and really understood the nuances of our community. And we started to all sit at the table and learn from each other and have to learn differences. And uh, we started to say, how do we really improve the lives of the most vulnerable youth in the community? We focused on education, health, and youth development. And we said we wanted to be um, the footprint of the Board of Trade because that's where business, government, and philanthropy came together. And so we've been on this journey and as a result of our work, at least uh, 50,000 young people annually are better served by nonprofits, business, and government from our uh, collaboration. 
That's great. I'm going to flash forward to more recent history, but then talk a little bit about uh, um, sort of the breadth of the work, uh, if we could. But now, of course, your your um, your your VPP raised DC. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how that came about and what what does it mean that these organizations are are now um, are now brought uh, brought together? So VPP, we um, were a capacity builder, and we had. We did it through investments. So we had an investment fund. We were able to go out and find where there was need and then where there was opportunity. Race DC is part, uh, was originally part of the Strive Together National Network of Collective Impact. And so they were going broader and deeper uh, in the community through change networks and really looking at how you bought tables together for people to come and discuss and come up with the actions necessary to make the change. And so we, um, we were both at inflection points in our lives and uh, needed change. And we thought coming together that we could really uh, make a difference. A couple of years before that, uh, they decided that they really wanted to have co-chairs of their change networks. And so VPP was the non-government co-chair for the Disconnected Youth Change Network and so coming together, bringing organizations that we knew about to the table and really going hard, we created the first re-engagement center here in the District of Columbia for disconnected youth. And so we saw from that example, if we could talk, struggle and push forward for change, we could really make a difference. And so we decided we wanted to go on this journey together. And so we started, uh, we bought the organization together last April and we've been doing strategic planning. We have a new strategic direction and we're building the organization so that we can have more young people that have the opportunity. But the key to this work is ecosystem change. It's not just individual efforts. You've got to deal with program policy and advocacy. That's great. And with respect to the new strategic direction, I don't know how much of that you can talk about yet, because uh, I know sometimes these are processes and uh, there are a number of constituents, but what of that might you be able to share with, uh, with us today? So I think the first thing that we're really trying to focus on is how do we align for action? And so we've decided that we want to stay regional. And so we'll be setting regional issue tables and collaborative tables jurisdictionally. Uh, but Raise DC, see, VPP Raise DC realizes that we can't do it all. And so we want to make sure where is momentum, where do we have the skill set. So we're going to be very much focused on early childhood, uh, career and college readiness, and young men and boys of color. Those are areas of work that we have been successful in, and we have a, a real sense of how we drive it but it is going to be a cradle to career collaborative. So we'll have people at the table that will be um, doubling down in their work on other areas, but we'll be able to come together in our tables and action and really be able to drive change across the whole uh, spectrum of a young person's life, zero to 20. That's great. I love cradle to career collaborative. That's a that's a that's a great way to uh, to put it. You mentioned regional, um, Carol, and are are you defining how are you defining the region in the work right now? So for us, it's the District of Columbia, it's uh, Prince George's and Montgomery County, and then the inner ring Northern Virginia suburbs. Got it. Thanks. Um, so when we first got started with our work. Um, most of it was really DC focused because that's where people recognize poverty and that's where they wanted to drive their philanthropic dollars. And so early in VPP's life, we had to help people understand that as rich as many of our suburbs are, there's growing pockets of poverty. So for example, we have a partnership in Fairfax County and we've been working with the county. They created a one Fairfax equity framework and it's, um, it's a community council uh, and uh, executive initiative in the county. And so they really have identified that there are nine communities of, of slowly but steady growth of poverty. And they're looking at how do they really address the needs of those communities, identify the resources, and then fill gaps. 
And so we're going in based on what we've done with our high performing nonprofits, what we've done with um, high potential nonprofits building their capacity and then working in Prince George's County with our ready for work champions for career and college ready graduates. How do we bring those learnings and work in partnership with Fairfax County? Because we know if we don't address the issues of all people in our community, none, none of us will live the life that we really um, can. Thanks for that. Uh, and that's, uh, that's helpful to understand um, in terms of how, how you define region and also uh, how you define the, define the work. I'm gonna jump back a little bit because you've got a unique perspective on, um, uh, on the district over an extended period of time. And I'm obviously new here, um, although I've had connections for some time, but it, it does appear that, that it's a pretty remarkable story um, over the last 25, 30 years in the district. Uh, and maybe a story that isn't told as much as it could be um, uh, around the world. But as you reflect back, and VPP has obviously been a central part um, of that, you mentioned the, the work out of the White House that, that helped um, set a framework, et cetera. What are the things that have made this work so well? And then I'll talk a little bit about what's still, what's still missing. Well, when I was um, when I went to the White House, President Clinton uh, realized that we were in a difficult period of time for the city of Washington, and with the federal government being the uh, primary employer at that point in our uh, our city and our region, he wanted to make sure that we were in partnership. And so, um, at one other point in time, they had had a special advisor on the District of Columbia, and so they decided to go back to that model. I think what was important about the work at the time was not only was there a special advisor that was the point person on all things DC, we set up an interagency task force across the federal government and then connected with the appropriate district government uh, agencies and tried to make sure that more resources were going into those agent, uh, into the city agencies, but we had the capacity built to be able to take advantage and utilize in a successful way those resources. So over time, the relationships between the federal government and the, uh, and the DC uh, government have been strengthened. And we heard from a other program last week or the week before that there's good relationships between the two governments at this point in time. So we were very focused on the economy. How do we really build the economy of the District of Columbia? And as a result, we have, a, we have a thriving economy. Now things have changed based on the pandemic period. But one of the things that I realized as things started to really change and I moved on to other things is that during that we didn't intentionally focus on the least among us. And so while most people in our community were doing much better in the District of Columbia, there are significant communities still that are underserved. And so uh, coming to VPP allowed my work uh, to really focus on that. And we've been able to connect with the business and governments in the, in the community that I think you, you're seeing improvements and there's a lot more to be done. Agree with that. You mentioned the pandemic. And if you think about the communities that, you're, that you've been working with, um, and you think about the effect on those communities over the last year, the data seems pretty clear that um, that uh, our response to the pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and potentially reversed, you know, a significant amount of the progress that's that's been made. Um, are you seeing that as well? We definitely are. Um, so we we knew about the disparities that are out there, but I think that the community at large really understands, you know, the, the disparities in various communities, uh, racial disparities, economic disparities. And I think people have focused, while they focus maybe on the city, they realize those, those disparities in, in every part of our region. Uh, so I think that we have to figure out now, how do we keep people focused on that? And how do we come together? I think that was one thing that happened very well is to see the partnerships and the funder collaboratives that came out for um, pandemic response. And I think we have to keep that focus and that cooperation and collaboration to really continue to address and, and kind of get to the root causes of the problems in the community. Yeah, yeah, We, I think the, part, the Greater Washington Partnership 
certainly our board members talk a lot about that. We, um, we came out with a study about two weeks ago that uh, EY, one of our partners had developed about the, uh, the future of work in the region. And you know, one of the findings is that there's a very substantial probability here that um, a lot of the companies will come back on a, on a permanent hybrid basis that, um, you know, e even firms that are based, whether it's in the district or in Baltimore or in Richmond, any of the city areas, it may well be that a substantial portion of their workforce um, only returns to, to commuting kinds of work, maybe three days a week. Um, and that can have some real implications for small businesses, particularly in, uh, in, the, in the cities, um, may create some opportunities outside of the downtown areas, but can, can, can really present some, uh, some, some, uh, some, small, some ongoing and permanent small business pressure particularly uh, in the in the cities. Um, is that an area of, uh, are you seeing that as well? And I guess the question is, is that an area of uh, prospective work for, 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 for VPP Race DC? So um, number one, right now I'm in my office in downtown DC and it just amazes me. Uh, it's a ghost town. Yeah. There's just no one down here. And so just the number of small businesses that we interact with, with on a daily basis, they're closed or they're at limited uh, hours or the, where I go to the carry out usually for lunch, everything is DoorDash, you know, and Uber Eats is if no one's in there, but a few of us every time I've gone in. So um, VPP, we wanna make sure that we stay connected. So our focus really is bringing the youth and vulnerable family perspective to all of the issues. But if we don't include them in the broader picture, then we'll never get to the solutions that we're trying to get to. So um, for example, I'm, I'm on the board of the Washington Housing Conservancy. And so I asked to be on that board because one of the big issues in all the families that we serve is affordable housing and community economic development. And so we wanna bring their voice and the issues that we deal with that perspective to solving those problems. When you talk about transportation as an issue, um, you know, the people that really struggle the most are those east of the river trying to get into the downtown area, get throughout the region. Uh, we had a very interesting experience with regard to transportation early in our time. We were working with a nonprofit that was actually uh, on the verge of scaling beyond the DC metropolitan area. And so there were uh, philanthropists that were willing to bring that program uh, into, um, into Baltimore. And they actually had young people that came to Baltimore to go to Europe's offices in Northern Virginia. It was hard for us to believe, but we realized at that point, it was easier for a kid to get from Baltimore over to, uh, I think it was Arlington, than it was, was for a kid in Southeast Washington to get there. And so we started to realize that one of the biggest issues and barriers to our young people's success was transportation. And so while we are not one that focuses on transportation, we've worked on some transportation issues. There are issues that come up within the education networks of Raise DC. There are issues that have come up in the work that we did in creating Ready for Work. How do you get a kid to a good school, then get them to an internship or after school program and home without them being on a, the bus or a subway for over an hour or two hours a day? So yeah. do, while we may not directly you know, deal with certain issues, they are tangential and we were looking for partnerships to solve those problems. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, Ready to Work a, a couple of times, Carol. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that program entails and, uh, and how it works? So um, we created what was called Youth Connect. We received an award from the Obama uh, administration for their social innovation fund. And so we use federal dollars to create um, for R&D to create our network approach, which was Youth Connect, bringing nonprofits several into one place to get greater outcomes for the kids in that school or in that community. And so we, we did it, we pilot, piloted here in the District of Columbia at the LAYC Youth Academy. And we said, if that worked, we'd like to see if we could take that program into another jurisdiction 
And the long-term goal is to see that those kinds of successes can be applied across the entire region so that we really uplift the lives of kids across the full region. So um, Rashern Baker at the time was the county exec and he reached out and said, you know, we'd like you to bring Youth Connect to Prince George's County. And so we went into three high schools, Oxon Hill, High Point and Suitland. And we bought six nonprofit organizations that filled gaps of programs that were not available through the school system. They were tutoring programs, uh, career preparation, and they worked side by side with the, uh, with the school teachers and leaders. And we started to see some real positive results, reinforcement of good values, but we really started to see academic improvements. Kids that were in career uh, academies, they were beginning to improve in their uh, skills development and passing the credentials to get into post-secondary education and uh, different careers. So um, we reached out to one of our philanthropic investors and they said, this is a business win. You know, if you can make sure that these kids come to us ready for work, it's beneficial for us to invest in it. And so we went from Youth Connect in the high schools to creating ready for work, career for, um, champions for career and college ed readiness in Prince George's County. And so we went from just taking program nonprofits into the schools we started working with the school system to improve their career and college um, and technical education programs. We then also worked with employers in the county and started to really demonstrate to young people the connection between work and education, that you need a good education in order to be this. What is it that you want to be when you grow up? And this is what the requirements are. And we started to see improvements in them all across the way was very interesting during the time we were in the county, we ended up being a real advocate for youth employment. Most people focus on employment at college. Well, you nearly need to start working with kids in middle school and early high school so that they can start to understand doing well in school yields you a better life. And so we started really teaching that and modeling it so we wanted to make sure that every young person graduating in Prince George's County was able to have some kind of job experience before that graduation. And so we had, um, for example, Kaiser Permanente uh, became a partner with us and we would take kids to the Center for Total Health here in Washington. And they got to understand that you can work in Kaiser, but you, there are many job opportunities there. And so, you know, we started to really get kids excited and see where a good education takes them for a better life for themselves and their families. And it's, it's been very positive. And I will say Fairfax County has been watching those programs and we're looking to see how we would adapt them in Fairfax County. And that was the whole model. You get started, you see what works, you start to move it throughout the whole metropolitan area. And that we have other communities across the country that have asked us to come but we say at this point, we still have a lot of work to do in greater Washington. Yeah. Um, how was that program affected by the pandemic? Uh, because again, the, the public schools, of course, have, have had more difficulty for lots of reasons in you know, staying open, reopening, et cetera. But um, observations on that, Carol? So uh, I would say probably the biggest difficulty was the career and technical education programs because those are programs that really stalled during this period because they needed to be in the schools or in the places of employment to really advance that. So that was, that was a problem. Uh, we stayed in touch with the school leaders and I would say the nonprofits that were in those high schools, they had developed very good relationships with the young people and they stayed with them. They connected with them uh, by phone, by you know, email, and actually started to do some Zooms beyond what they were required to do. But they, um, they, know, they knew that they had to stay connected to help the kids during this time, which we are learning now that kids are experiencing significant learning loss. But uh, we, were, we were happy to see how our nonprofit partners uh, continued to work with kids and kids were reaching out to them during the period of the pandemic. 
Yeah, we at the partnership um, did a deep dive in, over the summer at um, what the constraints were to reopening the economy faster. And we took a, a hard look at things like scaling and testing in the region and, and some issues like that. Um, did the, the, the whole uh, debate on uh, the pace at which public schools could reopen has been, um, and it's been a tough conversation in a lot of places. Um, has your organization been very involved in that conversation? Or how do you think about, about getting involved in that kind of conversation? Well, we, we have become involved in that uh, conversation. Uh, in addition to the work of VPP, I'm the co-chair of the Children, Youth and Families Working Group of the Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers. Uh, Lindsay Buss from the World Bank is my co-chair. And, uh, you know, as the conversation has come up about how and when to reopen schools, uh, there have been proposals of ex ex expanding uh, tutoring within schools. So we are going to have actually on Monday of next week, a children, youth and families working group meeting, which will be the first one we've had since the pandemic started. So we can find a place to bring everyone together so that we can really think of and learn from what they've done well during the pandemic and how we need to continue. I think the biggest message that I'm hearing is that we really need to follow the lead of the educators. Um, we have found out that rolling out in, in just a district-wide way isn't the answer. You really have to look at the context of the schools and the communities and see what's best and what the needs of those families are, and then try to come together to solve them. It, it strikes me that, um much of your work, which is really creating the tables and making sure the right people are at the table and the right conversations are happening, um, that can be really difficult to scale. Uh, and I know you have as an objective to make sure that the solutions expand across the region. What are some of the constraints to scaling uh, what you're doing? And have, have they gotten any easier over the years? So I, it is hard work. <laughs> I think you just have to start there. Uh, I think that there are models like uh, Strive Together Networks, there's Purpose Built Communities, there are many organizations that have been doing this for work for a while. Uh, and so I think they're models and examples. But one of the things we learned early on at VPP is that all of this work is nuanced. It's about building relationships and then really understanding the communities that you're in. So across this region, they're very different, you know, in terms of governance, government structure, demographics. And so you really have to think through, maybe you can use the model, but you have to look at it in the context of the community that you're in. I can see over the years that we've been doing this work, which is 20 years now, that people are watching each other and learning from each other. Uh, there was a meeting uh, that the RAG uh, brought together recently uh, of funders, you know, to talk about their lessons learned. And so I think people are willing to be more collaborative. What we're learning and the reason why we want to be a backbone is it takes a lot of work to do the coordination. And so we feel that, you know, we have been process driven and that process helps you get to the outcomes. And everything that we've done has been on a performance to milestones basis. And so we want to bring those lessons learned to the collaborations across uh, the city. So we're looking at issue tables, jurisdictional tables and regional tables and figure out what is the best structure in each case. But we, we realized a long time ago that one shoe doesn't fit all. Right, and, 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 and too quick doesn't necessarily mean better, I'm sure. Um, That's true, that's yeah. true. Um, we, we say that you always have to be focused on being bold and moving fast. Uh, but you never move as fast as you want. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to stay intentional to get the results to hard work. Yeah. Talk. Let's talk a little bit about the the. Um, you know, you'd mentioned the uh, cradle to career collaborative. This this idea that um, that uh, to do the right thing by youth, there really has to be an intentional approach um, across that entire time scale. And there are a lot of different. Um, 
players trying things. Uh, you know, we've we've got our initiative around Colab, which is very much digital tech um, uh, capability oriented, trying to broaden and deepen the pipeline of digital talent uh, across the whole region. Um, and we're doing work, as you know, you know, in K through 12 as well as in higher ed. Uh, but it is very focused around digital uh, skills and and digital tech and a lot of a lot of our partners on that journey have been the higher ed institutions just sort of given the way that work started but then there are also groups like cityworks which which are you know working hard on um, apprenticeships and kind of looking at the swiss model and um and seeing how we can really scale those things up um are there is there more opportunity to collaborate across these things um or or does that just create and if so, sort of how do we do that, I guess would be the question, uh, Carol, or is that also is sometimes ecosystems grow because you get a lot of flowers that bloom to a certain point before you start trying to get everybody into a bouquet, which was a really bad metaphor, but <laughs> Thought, thoughts on that, Carol? So um, I'll say one of the things that we try to stay on top of is doing the landscaping to see what's going on in the region so that we know what new innovations are out there. So when we started our work at VPP, it was about serving more kids, serving more kids better and making sure that if there were system disruptors out there, that we could help people learn about them and adapt them to their situation. So I think with those learnings, uh, I think of a conversation I had early with Jenny Niles when she was talking to us about uh, City Works and we were talking about becoming the regional backbone, her view was, I'm glad to hear you're willing to be the backbone so I can get the work done. And so I'll go back to what I've said several times is how do you find the different programs? And then how do you make sure people understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, they learn from each other, and then we can see where their gaps are to see if you can attach those to other programs or something else needs to be connected but I think people do benefit when they really can understand what each other are doing. When we started uh, Youth Connect, it was very interesting. These were nonprofit leaders who all knew each other, but we were surprised at how little they really knew about how each other's um, organizations worked, their points of view on issues. And so we really had to spend time sharing that information and then creating a common goal, common outcomes framework, and then they could work together a lot better. And so uh, I think that's the value of being a backbone and everyone can benefit from that. Like we're, we're gonna be very focused on, as I said earlier, uh, early childhood education, career and college readiness and youth boys and young men of color. So we're looking to see at who's really focused on other pieces of the work and how when we come to the re regional or jurisdictional tables that they can really keep people apprised of that work. So we really do see the continuum cradle to career. I found it very interesting in my early days at VPP that an organization would decide that they would start at a small piece of work and sooner or later, they wanted to start with kids earlier or stay with them longer. And so for us, you started to realize you have to find the best programs. You have to improve where it's necessary, but you really do have to have that high performing work and organizations across the spectrum. That's the only way you're gonna really solve the problems long-term. Yeah, that's great. I, one of the interesting things I think for organizations like these is kind of knowing when to hold them and knowing when, knowing when to fold them. It's a, because you're right. I think there's an there's an inherent um, um, uh, momentum toward trying to do more in many cases, and that's not always the best solution. I think the biggest challenge for us going forward is everybody's busy with what they're working on, and so how do we create the right framework? And, and the meeting frequency and the like, how do we make sure there's a process that we're benefiting from and not wasting people's time? And so that's where we're spending a lot of our initial thoughts uh, because we know where people are. And so the right time is the process and then plug everybody in. And hopefully in a couple of years, we'll see some greater results. 
Um, we've got a, a question, and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase that if I might, uh, Carol. But the whole um, the digital divide and skills training and for virtual work, IT careers, and you know, there's arguments that all the need for that has accelerated in light of what we've all been through. Um, you know, e-commerce is twice the part of the economy that it was just a year and a half ago, and so jobs are going to change. As you think about ready for work, you think about career um, readiness and college readiness. Do you feel like there've been, or are we on the verge of fundamental changes in what it means to be ready and what people should be ready for? Or do you feel like this is just a continued evolution? Well, I would say it's a continued evolution, but one of the things that we focused on uh, with our ready for work program is that we wanted the educators to understand what the um, high demand jobs are and what are the skill sets that need the kids need to get ready for those. And so we actually did some work um, bringing the people from industry together with the teachers and helping them to benefit. This is how you teach. And you know, this is how, you know, this is what we need. And some of those partnerships, you know, became very important. And then that's when we started to see the improvements of young people passing the, the tests for the different entry to jobs. Um, so I, I think it's that collaboration between the business community with the education community. And I think that we say career and college ready because the most vulnerable young people they're, they don't go the straight through path that many of us have gone through. They'll get a job, then they realize they need to go back to school. So there are programs like Urban Alliance and Year Up that are in our community that really keep the kids connected and help them to see that in advance, which is why we say we all have to sit at the table and learn from each other. But I think it's a lot of intentional conversation and education of adults that needs to go on to make sure young people really are on the right path and it's not fits and starts. That's great. The, uh, the, the, the Greater Washington Partnership has uh, decided that it, the frame for its work for the next extended period is uh, inclusive growth. And, 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 I, and I, both words are intentional. Inclusive is about having the most inclusive and equitable economy, uh, regional economy in the country. The view is that if we can achieve that, we will have the fastest growth, the highest return economy as, as well. Uh, and that we'll do the best for the talent that's here, but also be the most attractive place for the talent that, uh, that that's coming. And then growth because largely it's business, large organizations that um, uh, behind the Greater Washington Partnership. So of course, growth, innovation, entrepreneurship, those are all issues that, 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 that logically fit. But if you think about inclusion and equity and, and opportunity you mentioned you know we need to provide equally for all or we're all bereft to some degree but what's still missing in the region where where are the areas where the work really has to focus so you know i think the first thing is what i know that you are aware of is that businesses win better in an inclusive economy and i think there's still a lot of people that think too much about uh, employment for vulnerable populations and students particularly is charity. It's about opportunity and advancement for the entire community. So I would start there. Um, I know in many cases, the focus is at the college level. And so many of the young people that are coming to the colleges in, in our region are coming from other places in the country. And so while you want them, I have so many friends that I convinced to come to Washington after college and graduate school. We want them here, but I think there has to be a more intentional focus on the kids from Washington, DC, and then building the programs and the strength in the education with the apprenticeships and the internships and work opportunities. I think if we continue to just focus at older kids, we'll never get to really changing the community. So we really do have an inclusive growth economy. 
Thank you for that, Carol. This uh, this forty five minutes flew by in in forty seven minutes. So uh, we've taken a little bit more t of your time than we had intended. Uh, I want to thank you. Obviously, the Greater Washington Partnership looks forward to uh, doing everything we can with you. I think we've really got an alignment of of goals, uh, and uh, uh, certainly everything we can do to help you extend and expand your work and the processes um, from Baltimore to Richmond is directly aligned with what our partners and what our board would like to do. Um, congratulations on your work. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, my, my guest has been Carol Thompson Cole, uh, who leads VPP Rays DC. Uh, and we're delighted to have had the chance to talk with you today, uh, Carol, and thank you for all your work. Well, thank you for having me. And I appreciate this opportunity, but I know our teams are already looking for opportunities where we can work. And I also remind people that many of the innovations and the improvements in the nonprofit sector in DC have um, benefited the Baltimore and the Richmond communities because many of the nonprofits that we invested in early now have programs in both of those communities. So while we're focused on Greater Washington, it reaches to the broad scope of the Greater Washington Partnership. So I look forward to us uh, working more together in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carol. And it's great to see you today. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks everyone for joining us. This has been Fresh Take with the Greater Washington Partnership. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.